Hi everyone, welcome to I don't know which edition of SAS Engineering. Uh, we do this once in a while, uh, you know, uh, have a forum and get get interesting people to come in and and give talks on on interesting stuff. Uh, today we have Anirudh, um, who's uh, who heads engineering at Spotcraft, and he's a self-taught techie. He's been building software and startups for uh, about eleven years. He's worked in backend, frontend, and even Android. Uh, in recent years, he's been doing more frontend development, and he has uh, recently moved to the dark side, uh, to the you know, to the you know management aspect. So, yeah, you know, and he's going to talk about some very interesting things that they've done recently on moving to a mono repo. Anil, please uh, take it away. Uh, just one house housekeeping item. Uh, if you have questions, just please uh, just type them into the chat, and at you know at appropriate times, Anirudh will just stop and maybe answer those uh, questions that is coming in. Take it cool. away, Anirudh. All right. Thanks for the intro, sir. Uh, okay, I think we already have the first question, but it's probably for you. All right. Meanwhile, I'll just share my screen. Cool. I hope everyone can uh, see the presentation. Yeah, I can see it. Cool. All right. Yeah, so uh, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, how we essentially ended up migrating our Angular workspace to a monorepo. So it is to a degree maybe a little heavy on the front end, not front end, maybe like, like a little heavy on the TypeScript side of things. But I'm hoping, you know, like uh, what you can take away from is, is around organizing code, uh, you know, when would you probably end up having to think about a problem like this? And how, more importantly, how did you, how will you do this if, you know, you are stretched for timelines, if, uh, you know, you want to do this without disrupting. So the idea is that I have an existing code base. I might have to take a call like this where I have to completely sort of move to a different paradigm of working. What are the things I need to worry about? What are the things I need to think of? So the idea is to sort of talk about that. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is that why did we choose to migrate to a monorepo? There are like two aspects to this. One is the technical aspect and one is the non-technical aspect. The next thing is how did we execute this change uh, without disrupting our day-to-day? -day? And this is where, you know, like you have to understand how much, what was the size of the team at that point? What were the timelines that we were working under and so on? Uh, the next thing is what tools did we use? And uh, we ended up using this thing called NX. Uh, so what tools did we use and how did we leverage the benefits or like the, the actual advantages of NX. Uh, what are the challenges that we faced since then? It has not been a very smooth ride, uh, but you know, and overall it has still been beneficial. So what are those benefits? Um, you know, now that we've covered what we're what we going to talk about today, uh, I'll start at the beginning. So why did we think about this? Um, Spotdraft is an online contract lifecycle management software. What that essentially means is that it's used, it's something that is used by companies which has in-house legal teams. And it is used to sort of work on the legal ops, you know, where the legal teams interact with the non-legal teams, how do you make that more efficient? So that's like largely what we do. Obviously the details are, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot, lot of details there. But until January 22, so this is around two years ago, two and a half years ago, where it, most of our users or all of our users actually interacted with Spotdraft only through our Angular web application. And then we looked at our integrations roadmap and then we realized that very soon we have to build a word add-on. We had to build a browser plugin and we had to build an app for Salesforce. So for people who don't know what Salesforce is or how it works is Salesforce is this like massive uh, client CRM tool, so client relationship management tool, which does everything and anything. Like you can configure it to do anything. And they have a very rich ecosystem to build plugins and apps on top of it. And the one thing that was common for all these things or different platforms was all of them were using web apps to power their add-ons ecosystem. So if you in ever interacted with the word add-on, you're actually interacting with a web application that is running inside the browser, inside Word. Uh, similarly, I mean, I'm maybe most of you would have either built or thought of building some sort of a browser plugin at some point. So you know that's also a web application. That's like HTML, JavaScript, CSS. And fortunately for us, even Salesforce allowed you to, allowed us to do that. So this was the business motivation. So at some point we realized that okay, we have to do 
in addition to what we are already shipping for our customers, we have to now ship three more targets. And the most baseline or the non-business side of things was that, hey, we want the experience to be similar and consistent. Um, so that was a design requirement. From a programming perspective and from a tech perspective, obviously we wanted to reuse as much code as possible. And that was what, it, what triggered the entire conversation around what is the best way of sort of doing this, right? Um, before we sort of dive into uh, why did we choose a monorepo, what are the alternatives that we had at that time, I think it's very really useful to understand the structure of the or the state of our repository at that time. Um, for folks who have not worked with Angular, Angular has this concept of a workspace, right? So Angular out of the box actually supports a monorepo like structure where you can have multiple projects. So at that time, when we uh, were making this call, we had two projects. One was our usable library called DraftKit, and then we had the main application. And combined in these two uh, things, we had more than 300 NG modules. So again, for people who don't know what NG modules are, NG modules are a combination of a logical grouping of components, directives, services, etc. And we had more than 800 components in uh, the repository itself, right? At this time, we also had a team of around eight front-end engineers who were like shipping code multiple times a day. So we had like multiple commits. And that is where it was very important for us that we are able to move, make the move without disrupting their workflow a lot and move into a pattern that, you know, does not cause a lot of disruption in the long run as well. So the decision to make them like use a mono repo, why did we make that, right? And why did we not stick to the Angular workspace, given that we already it already supports having multiple projects? Um, the JavaScript team or the front-end team at that point already supported uh, not only the front-end app, but we also were maintaining a Node.js microservice, which is very critical to this day to, um, you know, like some processes in the application. So on the from a long-term perspective, we knew that we would want to ideally merge that also into our monorepo because we are already sharing a lot of uh, data definitions, schema, etc. But we are just doing it manually right now. Um, and with that view, we knew that you know we not only would want uh, Angular applications or Angular libraries as, as part of the workspace, but we would also want non-Angular things. So, you know, we the plan that we had in our head was that we would have like plain Node libraries that will host our models and data. We would have UI libraries which will host our components. We will obviously have applications, and we would also sort of move this microservice into the monorepo. And so that was the first reason why we decided we should not stick to an Angular workspace project. The next thing was we wanted, obviously, we wanted the most seamless uh, development flow possible and you know the best way to reuse code. So that was the other reason why we opted for a monorepo. Uh, the third thing, and this is sort of like, oh, we wanted a monorepo, but NX is a thing. So this is an additional advantage. Uh, we wanted to have incremental builds. So what we are seeing that we are already spending anywhere between 35 to 40, 45 minutes per build. So every time the engineer pulls code out, we were running this build in the CI for around 35 to 40 minutes. And with eight engineers pushing code out multiple times a day, this was essentially becoming like a, already becoming like a time sink for us. Not only in terms, time was obviously a problem. We also had to, you know, our costs were becoming, uh, were, were climbing with each and every day that we were contributing. So at this time, you know, like your question would be, hey, the main problem is you want to reuse code. And the other way you can reuse code is actually have multiple or like version libraries, right? Uh, and that was something that we were already doing. We already had like, we had forked some repositories or forked some code, or we had some old code which we wanted to reuse, again, as I said, in the main application as well as maybe our Express server. So we already had these like Git repositories which were reusable libraries. But what we were seeing mostly that, we were wanting to keep these things in sync always. Like we were not having the requirement of uh, running different versions of the same library uh, in different environments. Just we were not doing that. Uh, so that sort of negated the need of having version libraries. But the other side effect of that was that if you have a separate repository itself, then the feedback loop is much longer and your development flow is a little more complicated. Uh, people who have worked in the front end or like the node world they know that you know you have to use you have to essentially create a symlink between the library that you are working on and the target that you have, and that feedback loop is like a little long and a little more complicated. So that's where we decided that primarily because you don't need to have a version libraries, 
it will produce you better for us to move everything into one repository and move everything into a mono repo. Cool. Um, all right. So now that we already have all the background in place, I just want to talk about NX itself. Um, NX is this mono repo tool that has been developed by folks who used to work at Google uh, before. And from what I've understood, you know, that they've, they've bought a lot of learnings uh, because Google is famous for having that mono repo, right? So they've bought a lot of learnings from there. And it has first class support for caching. So, you know, it has incremental builds out of the box. And when we were making this choice, we only had three options with us. We could either use NX, uh, we could use Learna, and we could use Turbo Repo. Um, Learna is the grandfather of mono repos in the JavaScript world. But at the same time, it was not, it had already been put in maintenance mode. So that became a non starter for us because we knew it's not going to be developed actively. The next option we had was Turbo Repo by Vercel. It is a lot more mature today than it was two years ago. I think it had just reached uh, version one the year, like in like three months before we were making this, we were having this conversation. Um, the third thing with NX was that somehow it was very Angular friendly. Like a lot of other tools that we were seeing, like especially Turbo Repo, we were seeing a lot of their documentation, examples, etc., just running on React. And NX was uh, NX chose this chose this route of having you know being Angular friendly uh, from scratch. So that was a big pull for us. Uh, the next thing was it had a very active community. And lastly, as I said, you know like they were building it with support of cloud. Uh, you know like they wanted to have cloud caching, remote caching, all those things they wanted to have out of the box. And that's what they were building for. So that was, we knew that, okay, the immediate first step is probably migrating, but at some point we will end up leveraging uh, the cloud remote caching and stuff like that. Cool. Yeah, I think to actually understand better uh, the advantages that we've had since we moved to NX, it's very important for us to understand how NX works in the first place, right? So NX has this con concept of projects. So everything in an NX library which posts code is a project. So it could either be a library or it could be an app. And it could be tools. So that's the third category of projects. And each project has common tasks. So you have project and it has tasks. And tasks are like your things like building, testing, linting. And you could also have like custom tasks. And the way NX is created is that the task itself is carried out by something called an executor. So when you say that, when you tell NX that I want to run a task for a project, NX will go look at the project graph first, find what's the right project. Then it will go and figure out what that task is and what executor is supposed to run that task. And given whatever your configurations are, you, it will execute that. It will ask the executor to run that project, right? So the, this way, what we realize that is like what you'll see that very decoupled uh, with the actual project graph. So what runs the code or what runs your build or what runs your tests is actually not directly linked to how NX perceives a project or a task. So this way you can have multiple test runners, you can have different builders, you can have different linters, and it's just a question of having an executor for those. And a lot of these are available as NX plugins, or you can just write your custom executor and you can just get this to work. Right? And because now NX has this project and task graph, the next thing it works on is the caching layer, right? So NX creates a cache on a task and a project level. So let's say I, I'll ask NX that, hey, go and run the build for my component library. The first thing it does is that it sees, it computes a hash of it, of the library that I want or the project that I want to run the task for. And it will see if the cache is already there or not. So the, ca the hash is computed based on the source code of the project that you want and the configurations that you need to pass to the task. Right, so if I end up changing the CLI configuration, the cache is busted because the output might have changed because of that configuration. And you can also fine tune the inputs to these tasks, right? So once it has a hash, what NX does, it will first look at the local cache. If the local cache is missing, it will go and check the remote cache. And um, if the computation is found, it will just replay the entire thing. It will store, it will restore the artifacts and then just show the output to you as is. So when you're looking at, or when you're observing that as a as someone who's run the command, for you, the command just ran as it would have run. Otherwise, it just ran much faster. If it does not find that task, it will run that command and whatever artifacts are there. So I took the example of build, right? What it will do, it will take the output, whatever, wherever it has, has been outputted. So it would be like your 
compiled JS files in this case, and it will store them as an artifact of the cache task, so that the next time when the command is in, it can restore it. So it will just take those files, it will put it in the disk folder where it was supposed to be, and that's it, done, right? And I took the example of build, but you could also think that, okay, if you have a test thing, you might want to cache reports, or you might want to output your coverage reports. So it will probably end up, it will, you can configure it to say that, okay, these coverage reports are part of my artifacts, so cache these also. And then whenever the next time you run the build, it will or run the test, it will just output it in the same folder. The advantage of this is that anything that depends on these artifacts being present in that place, it will just work. It will just work. Like the next step in the pipeline will just work because for it, nothing had changed uh, previously. Cool. I hope uh, that was clear. Cool. So the next thing is, you know, like now that you've talked about how we choose NAX, you know, what are the advantages there and how it works. Um, I just want to take this very short slide to sort of document or like talk about how we ended up implementing or executing this change in the first place. So, you know, as I said that we, this whole project was triggered or the space for, to execute this project was triggered that by business requirements. You know, we had this Salesforce pipe app that we had to build. And so we knew that we were already having that timeline uh, that we are chasing. So that was the one thing. The second thing was we already had a fairly active uh, code base. People were committing things every day, multiple times in a day. So we wanted to make sure that their workflow is not disrupted a lot. <clears throat> so we had to devise a way where, you know, we can implement this change. And the next day when people log back in uh, with a very repeatable script, they can sort of get onboarded to this new thing and start working as fast as possible. So what we did here was that we essentially did a dry run. Right. And at this time we were using Angular 9 and we were using the Angular workspace with two projects. And unfortunately for us, Angular NXCLI did not support automatic migration of multi-project workspaces at that time. Um, so what we, what we did was that we decided that, okay, first let's replay the entire migration on a fresh workspace, uh, document all the issues that we see, make sure that all our builds and all are running. And then we'll essentially ask everyone to stop working at a point on a Friday evening, run that entire thing over the weekend. And come Monday, everyone should be able to go back to work as if, you know, like just install the latest stuff and just get back to work. Um, one call that we took over here was that, as I said, NX is very, was very Angular friendly when we were doing this thing, right? So NX actually supported taking our existing Angular workspace structure and just bolting on NX on top of it. Um, but we also saw that, you know, as I said, we also, we had plans to put a, Express app inside the monorepo. We had plans to put our data models, etc. So we knew that we wanted this monorepo to potentially be very diverse. And we decided that instead of bolting on NX to our Angular workspace, we'll just create a fresh Angular work uh, NX workspace, uh, let it do its thing, you know, go with the recommended structure. And that's what we did. So we just created a fresh NX workspace as if it was day zero. We ported over our port manually and then we uh, pushed it back. So once we got the tests to run, the builds to run successfully, we were ready to merge it. So that's what we did. We ended up merging uh, the whole thing. And then when people came back to work on a Monday morning, we had a script ready for them where, you know, they just had to rerun their NPM CI, maybe follow a few instructions and then get ready to uh, start contributing work again. So that's what we did. But there were things that we were not able to sort of finish in this timeline. And we decided to sort of take some shortcuts over there. We had a storybook set up for our um, component library before this, but we had to let it go for a while because we were not able to figure out how to, like NX had first class support for storybook, but we were not able to figure it out. So we decided to put it on the back burner for now. Uh, then the second thing we did was that, you know, we had, a, we were running a lot of issues with our tests. So we ended up skipping tests for the, for that duration where you can get it back into master. And the last thing is that we, did, we decided that we will not integrate the remote caching capabilities yet. So what this meant was that if you are a developer running a build locally, you will still get all the advantages of the cache. But because we did not configure remote caching, builds across machines or builds in the CI are not uh, taking advantage of that speed up yet. So after this, you know, uh, once we got into this, we got the next thing to work people started contributing code again, and we started building the app that we had to build, which was for Salesforce. Five months later, we finally got the room 
to sort of go back and take advantage of the caching uh, infrastructure. And at this time, it actually made a lot more sense for us to do this. See, when we started off the day one after migration, you have two projects. You have the app and you have the component library. And since NX performs caching of any task, whether it's test, link, build, it, anything that you want to do, it's done on a project level, right? So there's a very high chance that whatever commit that you are doing is going to bust the cache for either both of them, because if you change the library, the app's cache is also considered to be busted, or the app itself. So even if we had time, investing a lot of time in implementing the caching layer at that time would not have made a lot of, would not have been very effective for us because you would not have seen any um, time, you know, we would not have saved any time because everything would have bust the cache anyways. But five months later, when we got back to it, somehow we ended up with 40 libraries and four applications, which means that we had 44 projects that can be cached. And this is when we decided that, okay, now we can go back and, you know, we can connect it to the cloud caching service. And the moment we did it for, uh, the moment we config configured our workspace to talk to NX Cloud, test caching just worked out of the box. And over a 30 day period, the first 30 days after this, we ended up saving 17% time in CI. Um, yeah, and while the 17% number might not look very impressive right now, the main thing to consider over here is that most of our code actually still lived in the main application, which meant that if there's a test, even in one of the sub modules of the main application that has changed, the entire test feed for the application will get rerun because, as I said, the caching happens on the project level. So NX does not know anything beyond or deeper than that, right? You or like as a programmer, we might have an understanding that, hey, this module inside my app project does not actually depend on anything else. But NX doesn't know that. So NX will always buzz the entire cache for the entire application and rerun on the test. But this was like the first 30 days after caching. So we ended up saving 17% in compute time. So as I said, you know, like the remote caching for tests worked out of the box. Remote caching for builds so that we can save time. Um, ended up taking a lot more time and effort because we had to sort of redo and understand a lot of things about how build works, right? Um, so again, like starting point is every push that we are making is taking us 35 to 40 minutes in the build pipeline. How do we optimize that? Um, with 40 libraries, we had 40 cat, uh, artifacts that could be cached. So that is like the first thing uh, you know, that motivated us to sort of invest time into this. And the next thing that we had to do is wrap our heads around incremental builds. So if you look at the flow chart over here or the dependency graph over here, we have the app module which relies or the app project that relies on, let's say, a library called admin panel, which relies on teams and that teams relies on the access control library. Similarly, the app uh, project relies on a temp questionnaire library and that again relies on the access control library, right? So what incremental bit means is that when I change access control, when some code is changed inside access control, it will build access control, but it will also mark the entire tree after that as dirty because in this case, um, everything else directly or indirectly relies on access control, right? But next time, when let's say we change the code in the questionnaire library, but not in the access control library, when it is building the questionnaire, it will use the pre-built artifact of access control as a dependency to the questionnaire, but it will not rebuild the access control library. So you are saving time there, right? And similarly, when the app has to be rebuilt, um, it will just rebuild the app and the template, it will just rebuild the app, but nothing else, because everything else has already, already been built and it is saved as a uh, artifact somewhere or in the cache, right? So to leverage incremental builds, our libraries needed to be buildable. So what does a buildable library mean? Uh, for NX, a buildable library means that uh, something that can be built in isolation, compiled in isolation, and the artifact of, and the output of which it is, is saved some in the cache, and that can be directly referenced by any other application or project in your workspace, right? And a buildable library can only depend on other libraries that are buildable. So you have to tell NX that this library is buildable. Otherwise, NX does not consider that as buildable as a default. I think this has changed in one of the recent versions, but I'm not too sure about that. So again, like I have this example over here, um, and I hope I'm able to explain this well. Um, so on the left, I've tried to de de define like a folder structure, right? And you can just initially, like a pre-migration, you can think that all of this belongs in the same project. 
right? So you have the home folder which has two files. You have the auth folder which has two files. Um, and in the home folder, we are importing something from the auth folder, and in the auth folder, we are hold, importing something from the home folder. Now, because they are part of the same application, but they are like it will just work, right? Because all the code is right there, and the code itself does not have a circular import in it. But once you migrate it into libraries, which is what we ended up doing, so we ended up with a home library and an auth library, and the import statements would change to look uh, to something like what you see on the screen over here. And at this point, if you see, uh, as I said, for NX, the home library is one compilation unit, the auth library is another compilation unit. Even if you are importing something from a file inside, it doesn't matter. They are now circular dependencies because something in home is importing something in auth, and something in auth is import importing something in home. And this itself actually took us a very long time to sort of untangle because we were copying code from our main application and dumping it into libraries for use. But what we realized was that once you start thinking in terms of library boundaries, and once you start enforcing those library boundaries, NX can no longer compile that code even, right? So if a library, if home and auth are not buildable, this would not error. Like NX would just go ahead and build home separately when it is building auth, and it'll build auth separately when it is building home. But when we say that home and auth is buildable, it will try to build home first and use the output of that build as a dependency for building auth. Right, but then what will happen is that when it is time to do that, we realize that oh, I need to build auth for this as well. So then it'll go and try to build auth, and that's where it'll run into a circular dependency. And that is uh, probably something that took us the most time to un unravel or untangle our code base for, so that we can actually make everything buildable. And resolving these obviously, like how any circular dependency you end up resolving, it will it resolve it required us in many cases to create a new library. Uh, decide what the logical home or something should be and move it to that thing and rewire that dependency tree. So we spent a lot of time in this, and this is where we actually ended up seeing like some uh, good good time savings, right? We saw 41% reduction in our build pipeline over 30 days. And the output, sorry, the output of what this exercise was took something like this, right? So when we asked NX to build something, it decided that out of the 219 tasks that should have run to build uh, to build like the output that we wanted. So if you wanted to build an app and you had 219 dependencies or 219 projects that it depended on, it had to build 219 things, out of which 214 were actually uh, taken from the cache. So the actual work was spent just on building five projects. And this was possible only because we went through an entire exercise of making each and every piece of code that we are, or each and every project that is there buildable. So this is essentially a story, um, you know, till we end up completing the migration. What I'm going to talk about next is what are the challenges that we've run into since we've completed the migration, right? The biggest challenge is not purely technical or not related to code, but it's actually related to, sorry. Okay, wait. There are I questions. think that there, there, there's some discussions here. I don't know if you want yes. to pick some of the questions. Maybe sure, sure. Right. I didn't get the pings for whatever reason, sorry. Uh, how many applications do you have inside NX? Are they independent applications, code sharing, or micro front ends? Do you end up in situations when you want to get into inside NX? Okay. Um, I used to, there are two questions here. The first one is pretty straightforward for, 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 for me to answer. We today have uh, seven distinct uh, apps that we serve. Most of all of them are independent applications with code sharing. None of them are micro front ends. I didn't understand the second question. Very honestly, do you end up in situations often where you run multiple applications inside NX at the same time? Um, so what I meant by this is suppose um, so I take, for example, one developer is building up a particular feature, which kind of has to be done across like two applications or yes. required to, to be working on two applications at the same time for whatever reason. Yeah. Uh, does that happen often is something that yeah, so there are. Uh, so our entire uh, there are certain parts of a product where this is true, right? So some teams have to be very uh, conscious of this thing, because let's say uh, we have this team that maintains uh, dynamic forms, template questionnaires, and the templating engine, right? 
and that that dynamic form piece is actually reused in multiple applications i think it's at least part of the three applications that we have if not more so if you are working on that code base then you run into the situation a lot where you will make a change to your library and you will end up triggering a change across three different applications so have you ever run into the situation where uh, you need to run multiple of those applications at the same time and nx slow down slows down for that reason or something yeah so the recommended way we work on this is to not run multiple dev servers it's not a nx bottleneck it's just a bottleneck of running multiple dev servers mm -hmm. and that ends up taking a lot of uh, memory right mm -hmm. because what happens is that when you run a dev server for any of the applications you have the entire watcher and all running but you are also processing a lot of source maps and in our experience having source maps turned on is a major stress on memory so what we do is that we people usually end up running it one after the other so they would have one reference implementation or one primary implementation this is obviously beyond the test cases right so then people end up testing the fun application then they sort of bring it down then they spin up the other application and test it test it there but the but because everything is local right so it is a very it is a relatively faster process i won't say very fast because some of our applications just take have a cold start time which is very high mm -hmm. uh, but yeah people that's how they do it people are not able to like machines are not able to handle multiple test servers running in parallel understood this makes sense i'm sorry I, this answers my question yeah. okay i think someone from my team is also here so there thanks i use for answering these questions um <clears throat> What volume or percentage of code do you end up putting inside libs? Uh, I think as I used to answer that question, anything new that is there, we end up migrating. We are also running this very slow burn, long running project where we then audit of our legacy code base, and slowly, you know, whoever is on call, whoever is uh, has any downtime, they end up sort of moving pieces out of the main applications into the into libraries. Got it. When switching between different Git branches, yeah, this is something that has never happened with me also. Do you ever create nested components inside a feature UI or any kind of libraries? Or are they unit libraries in all cases? Yeah, so we have, uh, as you said, uh, thanks for the spoiler I used, but yeah, this is something I would have talked about in the coming slide. Uh, you know, how we have structured our libraries to have like maximum reuse wherever possible. But, yeah, cool. Uh, so yeah, I think the first question that you have to answer, and this is a question that you know we've tried to answer multiple times, and hopefully now we've settled on a definition that works for us. Uh, what's in a library anyways, right? So I think this is something that all of us in different capacities would have run into at multiple points for sure, because when you are deciding to create an abstraction, so that's the most just think of it like, you know, hey, I have this function that was being reused in, that is copied in five different places. I want to create a good abstraction for it. Defining that and how much effort that takes, if you extrapolate that, uh, that is a challenge that comes with defining uh, library structures. So I think that is the biggest problem that we've run into or the biggest challenge that we've run into where you have to build a lot of consensus around deciding the scope of a challenge. You know, like when is your library too narrow? When is your library becoming extremely bloated? Um, you know, there's a, there are school of thoughts out there which say that, hey, just have the smallest library possible. And maybe it could mean that you're creating one library per component or one library for one module or something like that. But with that, the problem is that dependency tree can get messy very fast. That's what we realized. Um, so what we did was that we, uh, we've come to a structure and we rely on spec or like high level design document reviews to sort of uh, come to consensus on new libraries. And we rely on code reviews to fight bloat there. Like, hey, you know, like if someone adds something new and as a component or, or a set of functionality to an existing library, we sort of encourage people to ask the question that, do you really think it belongs here? Why not spin it off into a new library, et cetera? The reason why it's very important to get this right is that if you, if you don't put a lot of thought into this, then you will end up with a very messy dependency graph. And you might end up in places where, you know, um, you end up with circular dependencies. And that was our reality, I would say, for like maybe a good two, three months after we migrated to the structure where people often ended up with code that uh, led to circular dependencies. 
so the structure that we've come to now uh, is you know we've split up the different layers this is something that we are uh, inspired by clean architecture in terms of how layers are defined but whenever you are creating something new we end up sort of following this pattern where we have like feature hyphen api feature hyphen data feature hyphen core feature hyphen ui and ui itself could be like different boundaries so and these are not only different libraries these are also different kind of libraries so mostly our data libraries are actually not angular libraries they are plain node.js libraries the reason why we follow this pattern blindly for all our data libraries is because when we end up uh, you know my like pulling in our express server or when we have to create something new like that we don't we don't want to end up in a world where you know suddenly your express server has angular libraries but now it's not able to you know cross compile it or transpile it or whatever because those are real problems so the convention we follow is that all our data libraries are plain node plain node libraries are if you have angular related code so the api libraries is where angular code starts seeping in because we start using services, we start using injectables, etc. That becomes a Angular library, and UI obviously is an Angular library. One interesting thing with uh, this approach, or one interesting advantage that we've seen here, is that we were able to repurpose our Salesforce application as our HubSpot application with minimal uh, code change. I think we were able to ship that entirely new application out in, I think, a week. So I'm talking about a new application which is production ready built completely on existing application, but swapped out the data layers or the API layers, right? The other advantage we saw is that we, in all our Angular code base, there is one small React component that lives because we had to implement some certain functionality a few years ago, and we did not find anything good in the Angular ecosystem for it. So we end up pulling in a React component. But because our uh, data libraries are all node, you can actually have a, a data library the React library depend on a data library without having to worry about your webpack bundles or any transpiling related issues because for it it's just another node library or a JavaScript library. So that is the advantage that we've seen with this kind of approach that we've sort of done. So the data layer uh, contains domain models and factories. The API layer contains the API calls, use cases, services, etc. And the UI layer again that is something we end up splitting into different libraries if we have to, but otherwise mostly it ends up being there. So the idea is that we don't aim to have a very small library. Instead, we have to we try to sort of have code that belongs together get grouped into a single consolidated unit. Cool. The next thing, and I think this is where it's going to get a little more technical and hairy, is understanding how TS configs work. So any um, the structure, the sort of the chart on the left, it defines the the relationship or the different kind of TS config files that you will see in any NX mono repo. So the way it works is that your entire mono repo will have, or your entire repository has one TS config base file. Um, this contains all your defaults, all your uh, base type of configurations, right? But more importantly, it con contains a TS path mapping. So for folks who do not understand, let me just pull up that. Right. So this import path that you see over here, right? So when we say import something from my org slash auth, it is not a, it is not something that is coming from NPM or like it's not something that we've installed from NPM, right? It is a path mapping. So in the TS config base file, there's a config which says that when you find this import path, go and look at libs slash home, sorry, libs slash auth slash index. And that's how you disambiguate your um, imports. So NX essentially has these barrel imports or barrel exports. So every library that you create, you have only have one entry point for it. And that is the entry point that is targeted in your TS config base file. So if uh, that's where that's how your imports work. Then for each and every project that exists, you will have a TS config JSON, which is the base config for that project. And that extends from the root or the TS config base of the entire library of the entire workspace. And then you will have like two more um, config files. One is the TS config lib file and the one is a TS config spec file, right? So what are the differences between the three files? Your TS config, the base of the project will contain overrides related to your compiler options primarily, right? So this could be strict checking, this could be, uh, 
you know you don't want nulls in your code and those kind of flags the lib file is how you want your output to be right so you could say that hey when you are creating a production build uh, it should be es2022 or it should use like common js or something like that so those the any any configuration that affects the output of the like the build sort of goes in the ts config lib and then you have the ts config spec which again overrides or inherits the base config of the project and it contains overrides related to tests so the most common thing that you will see over here is that you will have the types for your testing frameworks whether it be jasmine js karma whatever it is it will have overrides related to those things right why it is important to understand this is something that again we ended up learning because not learning this is like sort of you know it made our lives very difficult so imagine this workflow right you are creating something new you are building a feature or fixing a bug whatever it is you end up writing a lot of code it is working in your browser it works locally maybe it works in your test we'll come to that later and you push it and when you are pushing it in the ci the build the ci pipeline will try to build your project and there it starts failing right so that's what that was happening a lot with our engineers and then what happens is that when you are doing a serve right so again if you go back to the project and task mapping when you are serving an application that's a task on the application project and what happens is that it will take the ts config of the application to compile all the code when it is running the dev server right so you can have a hidden server dependency if you go back to the if you think of that home and auth example that was there a few slides ago you could have code that goes from home to auth and auth to home but because it is getting compiled with the entire application as one whole code base when it is running in dev server it will not like nothing will complain like everything would just work but because when we go and start running the builds you know we made these libraries buildable we want incremental builds it builds the individual libraries in isolation so it will go and try to build auth first it will realize that it needs home it will try to build home it will realize it needs auth and it will fail because it's a server dependency so again this was something that um we realized or like we had to learn how it works and why this error happens locally and why this error does not happen locally and why it happens in production so that is the difference between the two ts config behaviors or the multiple ts config files that you will essentially end up looking at when you end up using nx right the similar difference exists in testing as well uh, so between test and build what we saw was you know like uh, people were running tests again that was just working uh, or people were running code that was building successfully but failing in tests so what was happening was when you run the test uh, for let's say home and home is a newer library right so we had a bunch of old code we had new code when we are migrating the old code to libraries we did not sit down and make everything strict compliant but we took a call that all our new code is going to be strict compliant so let's say if home is a newer library which adheres to strict mode but it relies on auth which does not adhere to strict mode what will happen when you are running your test is that it will use the when you are running a test for the home it will take the ts config of home and it will apply that to every all, all of its dependencies and at that point typeso will just start crying that hey auth is not strict friendly right and that is the difference again the how code is actually run whether it's test or serving your dev server versus how it is actually built are different and that's where you see a lot of differences in behavior as well um how we get around this is we essentially just turn the strict flag off in the spec file so that's the advantage of having different files for different tasks is that when we are running tests we can tell that hey don't um apply your strict policy right now but you can still keep applying the strict policy in your builds which means that for home we are still writing code that is strict more compliant it's just that it is not applying the same uh, parameters to all its dependencies when it's running tests cool no more questions um yeah so you know we did this entire exercise uh, over the last year and a half since we stabilized it we ran into challenges as well was all of it all of it worth it i think it definitely was today we are shipping around seven applications from a shared code base um we have more than 200 libraries we because of this we have also been forced to sort of have a very structured approach to uh how we write our code right and here like i just have a screenshot from one of our engineers who uh, you know spoke about how 
they were able to reuse a lot of existing code and ship something out in 30 minutes or whatever, otherwise taken a few days of effort. So I feel like developer productivity definitely has been a major uh, boost over here. And if you look at the, actually, yeah, here it is. I think these are relatively newer numbers. Today in CI, we had around 60% of the hit rate for caches, right? And over the last 30 days, we end up saving around four days of compute time. So again, we are saving a lot of time and money at this point. And one point to note over here is a lot of our code still lives in that main application that we've been trying to break up, right? So this number will ideally just improve. So if you are able to actually devote a lot of time to uh, breaking up our main application, we should expect the cache hit rate to go up. We should expect to save more time because you will have a lot more projects that NX can cache and optimize. Um, the next thing that we've done because now we have libraries, uh, we are able to manage code code reviews better because what we ended up doing was we ended up configuring all our code owners. Um, if you guys use GitHub for PRs, uh, code owners essentially allows you to say that when this path changes or when something on this matching this regex changes, ask this team to go and look at the code. So it automatically up, uh, enforces code review. So we have very clear ownership based on libraries that this library is owned by these pods and this library is owned by this other pod and so on and so forth. So uh, code reviews are very uh, streamlined and straightforward. The next big advantage that we saw, uh, which helped us optimize a lot of these things even further, was something called NX Affected. So NX uh, Affected works is, is a very simple command. You can think of it like you can essentially go and ask NX that, hey, given these com two commits, find everything that has been changed between these two commits, right? And once you have that, you can actually ask NX to run tasks on these projects itself. So let's say if I take the example that I think I use as a question, right? Where do you have projects which um, do you have situations where someone changed one thing and that end up changing a lot of other applications? So what we have done is that we have an affected base build pipeline or a test pipeline where um, if I change, let's say that question in library that I spoke about, right? It will automatically, we will be able to get an output that because of this PR, these are the different applications that will change. For our master builds, it automatically also rebuilds only those applications, right? And it will only run the tests on those applications and so on and so forth. So you get the visibility also that, hey, over, let's say when you are promoting our release branch to a, uh, to production, you'll also know what are the different apps that need to be deployed because NX will essentially tell us that since your last release, these are the things that have changed. So these are the applications that need to be uh, need to be deployed. When we uh, sort of pulled in NX affected to, or when we started using NX affected to do this, it ended up saving us a lot of time. PRs that did not change a lot of things ended up landing a lot faster. So let's say you just introduce a new library. Um, as a convention, we just say that, okay, when you're introducing a new library, make it a separate PR, don't overload that PR. Um, and because that library does not, is not getting used anywhere at that point, that PR will get merged much faster than let's say, again, changing the questionnaire thing, because in that case, it will end up rerunning tests for the questionnaire and everything else that depends on it, right? So on the right, you can see the output from our GitHub pipeline where we decided like, we based on the output of NX affected, we decided that we do not need to build the Gmail plugin. We do not need to build the output plugin. We do not need to build the review plugin. What we do need to build is the SFDC app and the Word app, right? So that is how we have made our review or like the PRs or the CI pipeline a lot more efficient and smarter. Um, here is some numbers that I pulled out from when we actually ended up making this change. And the, mi the minimum time it took to merge a PR before was around 35 minutes. The minimum time came down to around 13 minutes because that would be your no op PR, which just introduces, let's say, a new library or something. The median time also went down drastically. It went down from around 41 minutes before we had affected to 27 minutes after we had affected. So again, like this is where, you know, um, as we kept going deeper into the whole NX ecosystem, we realized what are the things that we can do. And NX affected was probably my most favorite thing that has come out of this entire thing because it helped us make this change and make our pipelines a lot more efficient and smarter. Cool. So what's next? What are we looking forward to? Um, the first thing is for us is in-house lint rules. 
um, if you guys use ESLint and you know you wanted to have custom lint rules, it sort of warrants that you have to create separate packages for it. NX has created in recent versions, they have come up with a concept of workspace rules where we can sort of reuse everything that we have uh, or like it, in the same monorepo, we can add like rules and it gets applied automatically to everything that exists. So we, this is something that we really want to explore. We have a bunch of ideas that we want to create rules for and see if workspace rules are something that will make it easier to work with. Um, the next thing is more executors. Sorry, one second. The next thing is more executors, right? So as I explained what executors are earlier, so anything that you want a project to do, NX essentially offers it to an executor. So one uh, way we ended up using this was we end up using this to create the asset pipeline. So we have a icon library, which also exports like, which also sort of, um, so it has two things to it. It has a bunch of SVGs and it has obviously the components. And what we ended up doing was that we ended up writing executors to Sprite. So we did not want to ship all those SVGs, different assets to our CDN. So we ended up creating a SVG Sprite so that all the icons can load in one go. And we did it using executors. So now what happens is that only when you create a new icon or when you add a new icon to the icon pack, because executors also run with affected, right? So you can say that, okay, only Sprite things that have changed. And then NX will be able to say that, okay, because of this executor, I do not need to rerun this entire thing. I need not need to Sprite everything. And this seamlessly fits in with that build pipeline. So if executors were not there, you would have to probably write some sort of a shell script or some other script, which would probably say that, okay, before building the main application or before building any other library, go ahead and build the icon pack, right? But with executors, we are able to do that much more seamlessly because it becomes part of the dependency tree itself or the task graph itself, right? So that is one thing. The other thing that we are exploring executors for is some pre and post processing that we do today. Uh, for example, when you are building a main application, we want, we read like a bunch of configuration from environment variables. And today we do that using shell script because that sort of predates the whole NX transition, but that is something that we want to move. So we do like a find and replace using set, and that is something that we can potentially move to executors. So it becomes part of the code base. Uh, you know, it's something that a lot more people in our team will understand versus having to worry about shell scripts and it becomes configurable because you can configure executors using JSON. So again, it just becomes easier to manage the entire piece. So that is the other thing that we are exploring or like wanting to move to executors for. The third thing, which if folks have worked with Angular, they would be aware of this thing, but NX also has first class support for generators, uh, which means that we can enforce patterns and configurations, etc. You know, like, okay, we want our libraries to be built a certain way, we can actually overwrite the default generator for the library. Um, we want, you know, we want one click or at the, we want a command to generate, let's say the structure that we spoke about, right? The API, uh, lib code, that whole structure, we can actually end up creating a custom generator for it. So again, this is something that we are trying to figure out where do our engineers spend a lot of time on. And if there's something that we need to optimize. So NX has like, um, all these things or all these features sort of built in. Cool. I think that's it from my side. We are pretty much on time. Um, are there any more questions that I can answer? Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks so much, Anirudh. Uh, the talk very, very interesting. Anybody has any questions? Just have a couple of minutes. No. All right, everybody's going to NX. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks again, uh, Nirut, uh, for, for the, taking the time, and thanks everyone for attending. And uh, yeah, hope to see you sometime in the next six months to two years. <laughs> All right. Bye. 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 Bye.